Hello, this is Chris Jones. I'm with uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. I'm a county agent in Gila County, and I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Garden and Country webinar series, uh, Summer of, of COVID. i um, going to share some slides here to let you know what we're up to. Come on up. And today what we've got going on is a presentation about the biology of red brome grass. Um, I'm not sure if everybody I've sent this out to could appreciate or know what it is, but if you're here with us today, um, you probably already know what red brome grass is or you're gonna appreciate getting to know about it. So thank you for joining us. Um, this uh, webinar series is something I'll be doing weekly. Um, it will be 60 minutes or less. So, you know, it may be a little bit short. Hopefully it's, we finish up before noon, but if you got questions, we'll go, go till noon. Every Thursday at 11, at least through August here. So um, I got my presenters lined up here for June and I'll be setting up some presenters for July. Um, it features a variety of horticultural and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. A recording to this will be posted at this website, um, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Our agenda today, um, we've had some login time here and lag time, so thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Chris Jones, your moderator, giving us a short introduction. Here next, we will have the talk given um, by Cindy Salo on biology of red brome grass. After her presentation, we'll give some brief updates and an evaluation link that I'd appreciate that you um, take some time to fill out for me. We'll have a Q&A discussion with Cindy and myself, primarily with Cindy who has the, who has the answers, and um, provide a little time for some open, open discussion. And then we'll definitely wrap up before noon and end the call. Here's our presenter. This is uh, Cindy Salo. She's a plant ecologist, um, uh, independent researcher, and a freelance writer. So she has a website there, cindysalo.com, and you can reach her at that and learn more about her there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my slides here and share, and, and share the screen with Cindy at this time. And Cindy, you can give a little more background on yourself. So can you go ahead and hit get to share screen there, Cindy? Share screen. Okay. There we go. How about that? And then put it on move. presentation I mode. Um, I think it is. Can you not see my screen? It's, it's um, well, I can see your screen, but it's not showing the slide low. Oh. Okay, it, it, says it's, it says my screen sharing is paused when I'm on that screen. Um, how about there? Perfect. You are screen sharing. Okay, cool. You are ready to go. Give us a little introduction and Super. we're ready to go. Cool. Hey, thanks, Chris. You've clearly done this before. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Cindy Salo. My, oh, sorry. My, uh, my camera is in and out, and so I think it's off now. But I'm wearing the same shirt that I was wearing in the photo, so you'll recognize me. Um, I think I'll just dive right in. Chris gave a good introduction on me. Oh, and I'm standing up and I tend to walk. So if I walk too far from the laptop microphone, let me know. So good morning, everyone. And thanks for coming to learn about red brome grass, which of course is RBG, notorious RBG. And it's been in the news as I'm sure you know. And we can see here, this is a shot of the Woodbury fire a year ago. And we can see that we've got red brome, nice and dry, beautiful fuel here in the front. And we've got the smoke and the flames coming from the back. 
and we've got our native uh, cactus. We got some choya and some saguaros and some native trees there in between. But this isn't the first time that red brome has been in the news. Um, I did my dissertation on red brome the last time it was in the news in the Sonora Desert, which was in the late 90s. And the same thing happened then. We had two wet winters back to back and we had a lot of red brome and it helped fuel fires. When Chris called, I was kind of surprised um, that he called me to talk about red brome because I haven't worked on it since, well, it's been 20 years. Um, but people are, I guess it just isn't a big enough problem, as big a problem in the Sonoran Desert as it is in the Mojave. Um, people are still working on it there, but not so much here. So why should we worry about red brome? Well, this is what it does. This is red brome going up through a shrub. It likes to grow under the shrub. It's a little cooler there, a little more moisture, a little more nutrients. Uh, but in a big year, when we get a couple wet years back to back, you can see it's spread out. It's come out from the shrubs and it's uh, going off down the road there toward our saguaros. And um, this is, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. We'll You're soldier on here though. We're doing fine. Um, okay, good. Great. Um, and then, of course, a fire comes along. We've had a big red brome year. This is the Woodbury fire again. And this is what we end up with. We have burned saguaros. But you might be saying, but wait, isn't fire natural? <laughs> and yes, the Forest Service has gotten over its um, smoky bear putting out all the fires. And the Forest Service and other land, man ag land management agencies will let fires burn when they can, and they use prescribed fire. So fire is good in some places. For instance, this is the Great Plains, um, perennial grasslands uh, running from Oklahoma up to the Dakotas, and they get summer rain there. The rain comes up from uh, the Gulf of Mexico, keeps the grasses growing all summer long with, when the grasses are busy growing, and so f there's a lot of fire there. It, and the ranchers there even do uh, prescribed burning in, in the wetter, Tall, tall grass prairie uh, in the southern part, and uh, the grasses do just fine there. But in this, but historically, we had very few fires in the Sonoran Desert, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. And this photo is a great illustration of why we've got a lot of space in between the cacti and the shrubs and the perennial grasses that we do have, and so fires have a hard time moving until things come in, <laughs> red brome, and they carry fire. And we end up with this. We end up with dead saguaros, uh, dead cactus, dead Palo Verde trees, because these all have, as I'm sure you know, they have their photosynthetic skin on the outside. When your skin gets burned and you can't photosynthesize, you can't make food and you can't recover. So let's take a look at what red brome is. And it's this, it starts out green here. It has these very congested heads is what botanists call them. There's a lot going on there. And it's got soft hairs on it. You, from the first day it comes out of the ground, it has soft hairs on it, which the other grasses I'm just gonna introduce you to briefly don't have. With a good rain in October, red broom starts growing like crazy. And it will grow as fast as it can, use as much water and nitrogen as it can, um, and, and then in the spring it starts putting on these heads. So it puts on these congested heads, which then turn red, red brome, and what's going on here is all those extra parts that not other grasses have, some sterile florets, some glooms, they give the seeds a little bit of loft so these things can fly, you know, when a wind comes along. And then the heads start falling apart. Some of the seeds have fallen off. And you can still see these awns. So they can fly and the seeds can also walk. They can get stuck in your dog's ears and your dog's paws in your socks and your pants. And they really get around. So what isn't red brome? This is schismus, Mediterranean grass. Like red brome, it comes from the Mediterranean region. 
So I call them both exotic plants and I call them both invasive plants because they've, um, they move into places we don't like them and they cause us problems. So this is schismus and you might say, yeah, it looks like it got run over by a truck. Well, this is what it looks like. It grows out in the inner spaces between the shrubs and the cactus. Red brome likes to grow underneath the shrubs. Schismus is out in the inner spaces, but when we have two wet winters, red brome is out there joining it. Schismus is pretty short, and so if a fire comes through, it'll carry fire, but the flame lengths won't be as, as long as with red brome, which can get pretty tall in a Eh, let's go forward in a wet um, winter. And then here are two other, these are two native grasses. These are also smooth. Um, all three of these are smooth. They don't have the soft hairs on it that red brome does. And these used to be festuca, no, they used to be vulpia, now they're festuca, um, octiflora and microstachys. And these are winter annual grasses, just like red brome and schismus, but they never get very common. And if you have any ideas why, um, let me know because I spent um, a lot of time wondering about this. Why don't they get as big as red broom and schismus? And I've got to get these keys sorted out. So where's red broom from? It's from the Mediterranean by way of California. And this is some of my dissertation work published in Biological Invasions. Um, this was, I looked at this back the last time that red brome was a problem in Arizona in the late 90s. This was an herbarium study. Um, I went to visit herbarium, herbariums to look at the um, preserved plants and to look at where and when they were collected. And herbariums are usually associated with universities. And so I use that information to reconstruct how red brome got here and what it might do in the Sonoran Desert. What it might do in the Sonoran Desert when it reappeared, because as soon as I started working on red brome in the fall of um, 1998, we switched from a warm ocean El Nino likelihood of having, high likelihood of having wet winters immediately shifted into a cooler ocean surface temperature, La Nina, dry winters. And so I didn't do any field work for my dissertation. I did a pot study and a greenhouse study, but I wrote a couple thought papers. So this is one, and this is really fun. I looked at the herbaria and then I also looked at um, research reports, some work done in the Mojave in the 60s, and then again in the late 80s, um, and some natural history publications. So it apparently, Red Room apparently got to California before 1880, um, but the first group there, the open circles are 1880 to 1929, and it was surprisingly well distributed before 1920. 30. You can see there are open circles there in what looks like Phoenix and then also along what looks like the road between Ajo and Tucson in Arizona. Um, and then in 1930 to 52, it filled in among the areas. Um, these are new 50 kilometer areas occupied. So I was looking at spread, spread and fill in. So I ranked I ordered all the collections by date. And then if, if a subsequent collection of red brome was within 50 kilometers of a previous one, then I didn't, didn't include it. And then uh, the black circles are 1953 to 1998. And it was still moving then, um, like red brome apparently moved up or it was easier to find because people could take boats. It sort of moved up um, the Colorado River there at Lake Powell. So another thought, another thing I thought about while I wasn't doing field work was how does red brome behave? And Phil Jenkins has now retired from the University of Arizona Herbarium, but he talked about plant behavior. And I agree, plants do things. They bend toward the light, they produce more or fewer seeds. And as I showed in the previous slide, they can move around. I mean, it takes a whole bunch of them, but they can do it. So 
we have on here we have our native Sonoran Desert um, winter annuals and they've lived in the Sonoran Desert for a long time so when they get a little rain in October they say yeah that's really nice but we're gonna wait and see um, and Mark Dimmitt has done a good job of describing what we need to get a good wildflower display so our native wildflowers our native forbs our winter annuals they wait until we get a good rain before they germinate and this is apparently controlled by um, some sort of uh, germination inhibitor that needs to be leached from the seeds or like that's the best story I've heard so far and our native forbs of course keep a soil seed bank they're very careful with their seeds they're not going to waste them all in one year so they're only going to let a few germinate they're going to leave a bunch in the soil for next time they think long term they think in terms of time so i call this bed hedging in time that our native winter annuals bed hedge in time and then there's red brome which acts differently um, it doesn't need a very big rainfall in October, it just essentially germinates everything. All the seeds that are in contact with the ground and so can take up moisture germinate very easily in October. And then if it continues to get rain, it just goes crazy. So we, we, we saw the seed heads with the, the sterile florets and the glooms that help it fly and we saw the awns. So red brome strategy is I'm just going to send out a bunch of seeds. Some of them are going to get to some place where they get enough moisture that they can make more seeds. So I call this bed hedging in space. Produces a bunch of seeds and sends them out there. Hmm. I've gotten ahead of my notes. Um, okay, so what's Red Broom doing now? Um, I'm going to go back to this. So remember, this was a thought paper in Journal of Arid Environments. So it seemed to me that the drought in which I wrote this would really knock back red brome. That if it was going to germinate all of its seeds during a drought, there aren't going to be enough of them producing more seeds that it would really knock it back and it wouldn't be as much of a problem in the Sonoran Desert. And that actually seems to have been what happened in Tucson. I've been asking around about how the red brome is this year in Tucson. It's pretty spotty. But we're here talking today because it's apparently not what happened in Gila County. So we'll have to think about why that is. But in my defense, I'll point out that um, Marina La, La Forgia at the University of California Davis looked at soil seed banks of a suite of Mediterranean annual grasses, of which red brome was only one, versus the native uh, winter annual forbs in the Central Valley of California, and in fact found that during the drought, the native forbs were able to rebuild their seed bank because the exotic uh, Mediterranean grasses were sort of struggling. So, okay, but that apparently didn't happen in um, Gila County. So I mentioned herbaria, and this is on SciNet, and the URL is down there, swbiodiversity.org. It's a great source of information. When I did my herbarium study, I had to buy a plane ticket and get on a plane and go pull the physical sheets at the herbarium. And now not only are the sheets digitized, so you can see the, the sheets without going in, the information about the plant is in databases and you can say on a sign net, you can say, give me a list of all the plants, show me thumbnails of all the herbarium sheets, and you can say, show me all of this particular plant in a certain area. So I asked Sinet to show me all the red brome collections in Arizona. And I had to zoom in to keep from getting just one blob. So Arizona is cut off at the north. It, I cut it off a little bit north of um, Flagstaff in Gallup, New Mexico. So, if you, so this is where red brome has been collected. 
And if you click on one of the links, pick, click on one of the dots, this is an image of the herbarium sheet. Uh, this is red brome collected by Wendy Hodgson at Desert Botanical Garden. And you can see down there on her info card that she calls it Bromus rubens. And that seems to be what the USDA is calling it on their um, database. And I say <laughs> Bromus rubens is a lot easier to remember than the big long name Madratensis subspecies rubens. So here's Curtis and Bradley did another herbarium study. You know, in herbarium studies, you can learn a lot from them, but they've got, um, they have their limitations. And I'm gonna go back. Uh, you'll see there's a whole bunch of dots in Phoenix because there's a whole lot of people in Phoenix because people collect plants and put them in herbariums. And also a lot of plants get collected right after classes end um, in, uh, in the summer. So they're collected by people. Um, but after my herbarium paper where I looked at the spread of red brome has been cited quite a bit, you know, usually by people who have come up with a better way to do it because there are lots better ways to do it. There are ways to um, compensate for some of the limitations of herbarium studies and also the GIS has improved vastly. Um, and these people at University of Massachusetts are, um, have got a lot of uh, GIS skills behind them. When I did GIS, I started out with ARC. It was before ARC map, it was before ARC view, it was just a blank screen and you had to think of something to type in. So Curtis and Bradley did the same thing and there's a whole bunch of dots, they've got over 3,000 of them. And if the resolution were better on this, sorry about that, you could see that most of them are, are the lightest gray, unknown, unknown um, quantity of red brome. They have both qualitative and quantitative data. So for about 500 points, they had quantitative data. Was it a low cover of red brome or was it high cover of red brome? And it's, it is hard to tell the difference between the dots here, sorry about that. But uh, you'll see a suspicious cluster of high cover red brome right there at what must be Tonto National Monument. Because um, you, know, you, you, you only have data for where people collected data and the Park Service does a good job of monitoring. And you can find the reports online. The Park Service finds red brome everywhere in Tonto National Monument. So Red Brom didn't read my paper when I said that um, it would get knocked back in the drought. So Tucson, um, uh, the people I talked with, or George Ferguson is, is, on the, is on the meeting and he talked with even more and he reported back, it, it's sort of the same story everywhere in Tucson. Yeah, we got Red Brom. It's in a little bit wetter areas. It's not as, there's not as much now as there was during the, the late 90s. But Red Brome Central is apparently right here. Um, Liz Makings at the ASU Herbarium said that it's been well established in the Superstition Mountains for 20 years, for as long as she's been here. So, okay. <laughs> What I said is sometimes, what I thought was gonna happen sometimes happened, sometimes didn't. So if I were given two developing wild hypotheses, oh, that's right, I am, I would start looking at, I would think about uh, seasonal precipitations. Uh, when do these different areas that have different levels of red brome right now, uh, when do they get the most precip? Because in Tucson, so my first thought was, okay, in Tucson, we get more, a higher percentage of our rainfall during the summer. So we've got the black bars at the bottom are October through March, that's winter precip. But of course the October, I just, the October precip is probably a little more important. I just lumped everything together. And then the small white 
area of the bar for each one is April to June. We don't get a lot of rain then. And then we get summer monsoons, July to September. So my first thought was, if you get more summer precip, then just like the perennial warm season grasses in the Great Plains, you'll have more perennial grasses, number one, and you'll have rain through more of the year to keep your other perennials going, the cactuses, the, the trees. So you'll have more, more plants growing, less room left over for red brome. So, well, gosh, son of a gun. 45% of the precip in Tucson is summer. And then you got a little bit less, 36% summer precip in Globe, 29% in Tonto Basin. Hmm. Except then you look at them and all three of those areas get about, six, on average, six inches of rain in the summer. Maybe the difference is those huge black bars, all the winter precip in Globe and especially in Tonto Basin. It's a huge difference. So maybe, you know, there's just so much winter precip, nothing can stop red brome. And then I went and looked at Las Vegas, which still has a serious um, red brome problem. So, okay, they get very little summer precip, but they also don't get very much winter precip. So any number can play. If you have any idea why there's more red brome in Globe and Tonto Basin and Las Vegas than Tucson, be sure and chime in. So what can we do about red brome? It's not very exciting, but this is my number one favorite thing to do. If you pull plants out by the root, they don't come back. I'm from Minnesota. Apparently I'm supposed to say roots but I have trouble with that. So pull them out by the roots. And I prefer this, you know, some people say, well, you know, we'll mow it or we'll graze it or we'll get goats to eat a bunch and then walk on the rest. And my argument is that the perennial grasses, the cactus, the shrubs, the trees, those are the thin green line. Those are what keep out the invasive plants. They keep out the plants that we don't want. So if you mow it, then red brome says, why, thank you very much. You got rid of the competition. I can regrow here, unless you do it uh, late enough in the season, of course. So, you know, I like pulling things by hand and also try and beef up that thin green line. Uh, this is work done by Scott Abella at UNLV. He's done a lot of work with red brome this is actually some work he did looking at uh, revegetating areas for desert tortoise. And he found a couple of plants that survive very well when planted um, at Lake Mead. Spheralsia did really well. And in his area, white bursage, Am Ambrosia demosa did well. But he you know, in your area, maybe it's um, triangle leaf bursage. So my advice is to look around and see what natives are doing well and plant those. Um, I take care of a pretty, pretty large and weedy area where I live. And I use the whack and water approach. You know, if, if, it, if it's a pretty big area. So some, some places I pull weeds by hand. Other places I'll get my weed whacker in and I'll reach over the native grasses and I'll, um, I'm gonna get that hoary crest or I'm gonna get that um, knapweed. And then I water the plants I like. I've got a beautiful stand of Um So whack and weed, plant some natives, and everybody loves Spheralsia. If you sneak up on it early in the morning, you can sometimes catch solitary bees sleeping in there, um, swaying in the wind. I don't know that this is a solitary bee just waking up or if that one's after um, nectar. And then if you want to spray, you can do that. U of A Extension uh, redid their non-native invasive plants of Arizona book last year and it has some suggestions for chemicals and it says treatments that include seeding of natives are particularly effective. Very nice. 
So we know we got some red brome this year. What's our fire outlook look like? Um, there's a lot of models. This one came through my inbox from NIFC, National Interagency Fire Center in Boise. Um, the red is above average risk, although it doesn't say how much above average. Um, but yeah, do you see any red there? I do. And then the other question is, so are we going to have red roam next year? Well, I wonder if we're going to have much rain. My favorite uh, El Nino forecast site seems to have disappeared, but I found this at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And they say neutral condition, neutral, neutral SST sea surface temperatures. Da, da, da. So to make long cumbersome sentences short, um, nothing right now, maybe a La Nina uh, later in the summer and fall. So while we mull over our chances of having some fires this year, I'll thank the people who answered my questions and I'll turn it back to Chris and see if you guys have questions. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna keep your great picture up here for a little bit um, and we can open this up for some questions. First thing, I want people to look down below. I'm trying, trying to see if I can pull up our, our, present, our participants. I've got a list of participants here. And there's something down there that with reactions. And I don't know what would happen if you push that little reaction button. I think you have to have your picture up, so I guess we won't be able to necessarily do that. Oh, there's the picture. I think you can see mine, yeah. But I don't- Oh, there. Yeah, so Cindy, that's my applause for an excellent- <laughs> And um, one other thing I'm gonna ask people to participate in I'm gonna pull up a poll, I'm gonna launch it, and I'm asking, how did you um, hear about today's webinar? And I wanna know if you got an email directly from me, if you got an email forwarded from somebody, if you got it from Facebook, word of mouth, or I see somebody saying other. So um, I should have had newspaper on there too, but. I've been primarily trying to promote this through Facebook and email. I just wanted to see what type of success I'm having. So while you do that, um, if you have a question for Cindy, please go ahead and unmute your microphone and, um, and ask. This is the time to do it. So it's our discussion. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just continue to share some of the things with my concern. Um, Last year, when we had the Woodbury fire, I would drive frequently in the Tonto Basin. And that winter, you know, from January, February, March, you know, I just watched how that red brome filled up all the void spots between the creosote. And um, mm. I had, and, and you know, when it's in its best color for that short, win short window of time, it was actually kind of a pretty, pretty scene, but I knew <laughs> that it was a dangerous scene. And then unfortunately, the Woodbury fire ended up being over 100,000 acres spread down through the Tano Basin. And, um, and I really feel that red brome was a huge factor in carrying that fire. When we've had fires earlier, schismus and wild oats and other, you know, we had the edge fire and the willow fire. I thought those were considered more of the invasive grasses that were carrying those fires. And, but so it was news to me to realize Red Brome's been with us all this time because it just came on such gangbusters with, with, in my eyesight, right? In my, in my view shed, but I thought it was fairly new here. Um, the other concern is how here in, Arizona, in Globe Miami, Cobra Valley area, it just really came up through the canyons and up and down the highway in ways that I hadn't noticed in the 20 years that I've been living here. And, um, Mowing it's going to be really important, important, at least knocking it down, weed eater, you know, after it's dead, so that's not a the fire hazard it is right now to be able to carry a fire in our neighborhoods and just kind of a wildland urban interface type of issue. That's that's one of big concern of mine. Um, and what I saw in my yard, I was able to pick by hand, but we can't pick it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So 
just wanted to share some of those ideas with you. Um, open it up to um, your response. And then again, so, sorry, I'm hogging all the microphone here, guys. I'll let you guys ask some questions too. Any comments to that? Hi, Chris, this is Susan. So it looks like we want to pull the red brome because of the fire hazard. Is yeah. that correct? Okay. Would you say there's, there's other issues with that red brome, um, Cindy? Most of the fire hazard. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right, Chris. Sorry, I should have made that clear. I, I was just in my mind thinking about, you know, getting rid of it, um, so that it's not a problem in the future. But yeah, definitely, if you've got a fire hazard, you've got to get rid of it. Um, you know, my concern as a plant ecologist is, um, you know, when red brome is growing rapidly, it's going to produce more seed, there'll be more seed for next year. And if it's growing big and picking up the nutrients that the uh, native forbs um, you know, the native forbs are going to wait, and if red brome gets an early start, it goes fast, it dies young. The natives are going to have a hard time replenishing their seed bank. So I'm in favor of pulling it out, getting rid of it to protect the, the native forbs. But of course, if you've already got a fire hazard, you've absolutely got to um, pull it down. Sorry about that. Idea. Okay, so uh, I think the people have their microphones open. Um, I did get a message from Steve Thompson asking to please put again the worst grasses to fire. Um, so what are you going to say to that? Worst grasses to fire? I guess. Well, the two that I talked about were uh, red brome, which starts under the shrubs and then moves out into the inner spaces in the winter, and schismus that's sort of always there, but a little shorter in the inner spaces. But of course, I was only talking about annual grasses that carry fire. Uh, buffalo grass is getting to be a bigger and, and bigger problem. And, you know, I, I haven't been following it, but Chris, I would guess that in many parts of Arizona, it's our worst problem. Red brome. It's there every year. It's a perennial. What do you use? Um, red brome is a serious problem, and um, it, it, and it just depends really from year to year and the way that we have these wet winters. This first that strategy of producing as many seeds as possible and that's the whole world. Um, it's a pretty, it's, it's a lot of these winter um, exotic crops of earth, because we don't really have a lot of energy. So they've already grown during the winter, they put the seeds in the ground, but they kind of start to get So we just had a tremendous strategy um, to work on it. Exotic, um, exotic winter grasses. You know, I've, I've been very serious problems. We're a little higher elevation. Our red, our uh, we don't seem to get buffalo grass grass much above uh, 2,000 feet at higher elevation. So we find buffalo grass going out to the area. The bumper grass has not been a big I'm having a hard time hearing you, Chris. I don't know if the internet is having trouble here. No, or... I somebody is got the microphone on and they got a lot of. Was that it? I think it was Carl. Oh, it's fabulous now on this side. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. Um, if, if you had a question, uh, I wanted you to ask, but yeah, I guess yours was the one providing a little background noise. I hope really people could hear me with what I was sharing on that. Um, Concer concerning fire caused by grasses, 
uh, the fountain grass is spreading in wild lands. And I wondered if anyone offers any comparison of the fire effect that might be caused by fountain grass, if that's comparable to buffalo grass. Great point. Great point. I've forgotten about fountain grass. I have not really been following that, but you're absolutely right. It's a perennial grass. It's invasive. We'd like to get rid of it and it carries fire. Part of the problem with the buffalo grass is the heat of the fire. When it burns, it creates a very hot fire that's very damaging. And I'm curious if fountain grass, which is related and, and, and looks similar, if, if that also generates the same kind of hot fire. That's a great question. Let's find out together. Okay. Okay, okay Cindy. Yeah. Carl here. Hey, um, Carl. hey. Um, on your uh, maps on like the rain and the difference in comparing Las Vegas with uh, Tucson. Yeah. It, I mean, there's two or three things I could think of for that area, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think the elevation of Vegas is about the same as Tucson, um, but I think there's, besides their uh, difference in seasonal rain, there's, uh, I think there's quite a bit of difference in the uh, temperatures, especially mm -hmm. over the winters up there. Yeah. And uh, so I would say, you know, looking at elevation and um, probably prevailing temperatures throughout the months could be uh, an also an aspect of, uh, of some of the differences and uh, maybe even some of the competition that they have with other invasive plants up in that area. Also because uh, in the Las, Las Vegas area and Mead Park and all that, um, there's a lot more effort to control things um, there than there are in other areas just because of the manpower and the money that's thrown at it. So those are just some of my comments off the top of my head. Good. Cindy, Cindy would, would you be able to compare and contrast uh, red brome with cheatgrass and, and whether cheatgrass might be um, more of a problem up in the uh, towards the Mojave Desert? You know I I've actually worked more with cheatgrass than red brome, and I just describe them as being the northern and southern analog. Cheatgrass in the north and red brome um, down south. And of course there is an area, and I think it was in the Curtis and Bradley paper, no, sorry, different paper, where they overlap. Um, I did see a nice paper where they looked at what limits red brome's northern movement, and it's a sudden uh, a cold snap in, in the fall. It just can't handle it. It falls apart. But from what I've seen, um, from what I've seen, the, um, they act very, oops, they act very similar. And um, yeah, I just think of them as being northern and southern analogs, you know, in, in, different, in different communities. Because of course, sagebrush, I'm sorry, cheatgrass gets into sagebrush. The sagebrush is, is Killed by the fires, and the perennial grasses in sagebrush country only have that tiny window for for growing between, um, you know, March when the temperatures warm up until June when um, uh, the soil moisture that falls only during the winter dries out. And just an added comment on that, because the cheatgrass is more prevalent in the uh, the Great Basin. It's almost like between cheatgrass and red brome. It's like that line between the Great Basin and the Mojave. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you have a significant change of temperatures uh, around the year in the Great Basin versus the Mojave. So I think those are a factor. Plus they tend to be a competition to each other because of, you know, they can't really overtake each other uh, along those lines is my thoughts. Yeah, good, thanks for that. Hey, Cindy, let me just um, interrupt here. If people would look into their chat box, I put a link there to a Google survey and it's the evaluation for this um, 
webinar. Um, it is super short. It'll take you less than two minutes. Just kind of ask you how it was, give me some ideas from other stuff, let me know where you checked in from, and it just allows me to um, improve this and participate. So please check that in your chat box and, and, and pro provide me some feedback. I really appreciate it. Um, more more questions? Question. Yeah, go ahead, George. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really great uh, presentation, Cindy. Thanks very much for doing that today. Um, I just had a question if you could comment on the, all these environmental factors you mentioned, uh, precipitation, the temperature, and then what was included here is elevation or um, even competition, as you talked about. Can you comment on ground disturbance? You mentioned mowing as an option. Um, pulling, pulling the plants are better. But I'm just wondering about disturbance of the ground and what kind of um, a factor that might be on the germination and, and distribution and spread of this plant by its seeds. Any, any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, you know, we think of exotic invasive plants as, as only coming into disturbed areas, but I'm going to argue that every place is disturbed. So, um, yes, I think absolutely. Um, you know, weedy plants, cheatgrass, red brome, they come in where the soil is disturbed because there's not as much competition and they're able to grow fast and take advantage of that. So absolutely, good point. Um, I should have mentioned that. Another thing about um, controlling it is um, uh, ground disturbance. Um, Cindy? Yeah. Just thinking about um, what I learned about tumbleweeds years ago, is that those plants just love it. When you grade the side of the road, they'll just come right back because that's what they want. That's, when, that's, a, behave, that's a plant behavior, right? Plant and, and I'm behavior, just think, yes. Yeah, just thinking about, just occurred to me with these places that I have seen the plant recently, every single place where it did grow, which was sparse, every place was a disturbed ground. Yeah. Cattle, the side of the road, various the sidewalk areas. Every place was a disturbed site. Just wondered if that might be a major factor in something the seeds actually want as the behavior. But, yeah, exactly. You know, there. I think it's a, it's a matter of less competition. You know, you mow it, you get everything up out of the way, and Red Brome says, "That's great. I can grow fast. I can get started before anything else can." And thanks for the reminder on the, the, the bladed sides of the rows, roads and the, and the tumbleweed. Um, yes, I've seen that. I'd forgotten that. There can be a really thick crop next to roads. Thanks. Yeah, and, and thanks for bringing that up, George, because that's what really caught my eye in the Globe Miami area. It just really took off on the roadside. So I just figure one year we bring in the seed mix and then the next winter it gets um, wet and, and up it comes. I mean, it was just really heavy on the roadsides. Yeah. Okay, and any other questions? So, so Chris, you're saying that <clears throat> red brome is bringing in, brought in <clears throat> through deliberate seeding of other, no. other seed? No, I think that um, it is wind carried and it is carried in, uh, you know, the wheels and, and vehicles of cars, but once, but it's just so successful in that once it has uh, a chance to produce a little bit of a seed base, the next year the seed base just goes boom. And mm -hmm. having a good um, disturbed site, the roadside areas, just makes it really easy for them. They don't have any competition. Okay, so, so you're not seeing it come in with deliberate hydro seeding or other procedures? No, I do not think that was the case. Um, when, when Sahara mustard showed up in Tano Basin, I think it was a contaminant in the seed mix because we did not have it before and they were doing some road work. But you know, it hasn't taken off in Tano Basin since that, that, that event in 2002, 2003, when we had that wet event, which kind of surprises me because we've had events to really get it going. I'm not saying it isn't there and it doesn't grow, but it doesn't cover 
the ground like it does in the Mojave Desert. And then, yeah, because I think that still still does that out in um, Mojave County where Sahara mustard just really fills in the, the voids in the spaces. Somebody can help me out with that, but still acting that way. Interesting. Yeah, and roadsides are different. Roadsides are great places for weeds. There's a lot going on. People walk along them. Animals walk along them because it's easier to walk there. Um, there's more light because you've got the open road. There's runoff. Um, roads are great places for weeds. And, you know, every... Every, weeds are terrible ways to bring weed, great ways <laughs> to bring weeds in. So thanks for your observation. Okay, so we're still doing good on time. If we got some more questions, we'll take them. Okay, this is Mary from Southeast Tucson in the Rincon Valley. Um, we had a lot of red broom this year. Um, it was in uh, areas that was not been disturbed for the last five or 10 years. Uh, we didn't see it come in on construction wheels where we had seen buffalo grass and Sahara mustard and Russian thistle coming in around new construction. We saw virtually no red broom in the disturbed areas. It was in uh, well-established landscapes. It was in open space. Um, that's not been disturbed for many years. So uh, not quite the same experience that you all are having. Oh, but what you described sounds like Tano Basin last year. Yeah, thanks for that, Mary. And the, the, one of the first photos I showed of Red Brome, you know, my argument is, you know, every, pretty much every place, because we've been everywhere, is disturbed enough for red broom to get started underneath those shrubs where it's a little moister, a little more, a um, little more shade. And remember, animals are there. You know, they're they're pooping to add nutrients and they're scratching down there. Um, red broom can find enough disturbance just about anywhere, as Mary's given us a good example of. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you one more slide here. Come on, of course it's not moving. There we go. Um, wanna let you know that next week, I'm going to have Janique Artiola talk about biochar. It's just give kind of an introduction to it and its uses. And although Janique is a water quality specialist at the university, um, he wrote an excellent bulletin on biochar a couple of years ago. And I've been looking at biochar as a issue for wild and urban interface fire and an opportunity to, to, to use that, that, that wood, you know, the, bio, the, the biomass and make something useful out of it. Um, so he's gonna talk about its uses. It's supposed to be a soil amendment that helps to hold moisture. It, it is, but, and, and just some of the things about it. The next week, I'm actually gonna have another talk on biochar with uh, Darren McAvoy, who's the uh, woods product specialist in um, Utah State. And he's gonna talk about how to make a bio biochar kiln. So something that's a little bit smaller and easy, easy to use at kind of a neighborhood um, HOA, Firewise, USA type of level. So I'll be advertising those. Um, the, the information on all those talks is available right there at extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. Um, it looks like I've gotten a good connection with our technical people, and I think I'm going to be able to get this presentation up at the website very soon. If, if it's taking a little while, I'm going to have the recording and make it available to people um, by request. But as soon as I can, this is all going to be posted to, to that website. Um, any other questions for us here? Any, anything else we want to share or talk about? Well, it's 11.54. We, um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, I, we can't all um, 
be nice to show our appreciation with a, with a little hand clapping. Um, and so that'd be good. But uh, there you go, Michael, thank you. I'm looking for mine and to kind of change the screen here. I can't find it right now. Um, and Cindy, thank you so much for your interest in giving this talk. Um, raise our awareness of, of this weed again. And I just wanna encourage people again, go to your, uh, uh, the chat box, click on that link for the evaluation and give me a little bit of feedback. With that, I'm gonna say, I hope you all have an excellent uh, day and weekend and, um, and bring this to a close. I'm gonna hit, hit in, in the recording. Thank you, goodbye. Cool. Looks